uh, for today. You can repeat after me. Somebody say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Say, I believe the word of God. Say, right now, I'm renewing my mind to act on what I believe. When I obey God's holy word, God's blessings overtake me. New opportunities, they meet me. Supernatural increase and abundance, that it manifests in my life. Say, I am an overcomer. That means I always win. And no weapon that's formed against me prospers, is successful. In Jesus' name. One more time, give the Lord a shout. Isaiah, Isaiah 43 and 18, it reads, faith, it reads, remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I do a new thing, now it shall spring forth, shall ye not know it. I'll even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. We are teaching in the second division of the lesson series, Faith for New Chapters. Somebody say, Faith for New Chapters. And by new chapter, we mean fresh starts, usually after significant changes, uh, dead ends or crossroads in life. And God breathed this lesson into me several months ago uh, as I began to come into this place personally. From a ministry perspective, there were things that were coming to a conclusion and a close. And God was so faithful to give me a word, not only for me, but also for those that I pastor on how to have sufficient confidence and courage to turn the page and not hang on to past hindrances, not hang on to past hang-ups, not hang on to things that did not happen with my harvest in the old chapter. But he says, you got to believe for the new. Somebody say, believe for the new. Now, by the new, God has expressed to us in the first division that it was not necessarily the new things Uh, that are brand new, that will occur in our lives, even though they're significant. But God made me aware that it's the things that we often overlooked that are powerful, that are prosperous, that can give us provision. And just because we don't notice them for different reasons, we can't benefit from them. Somebody say, anything you overlook, you can't benefit from. Y'all ever hear them stories about the people who found, you know, treasure in the attic, you know, they were just cleaning up the attic one day and somebody had stashed, you know, a million dollars in jewelry up there and uh, they living from check to check. But, you know, up in the attic, somebody say up in the attic, somebody going to check the attic, praise the Lord, right up in the attic. There are millions that are there, but because you didn't know about them, because you weren't aware of them, they could not benefit you. And there are benefits within the resources sometimes that we're married to. Ooh, did he say, did you just call your a spouse a resource? Yes. Your spouse is a resource. There are people in your family resources that you often overlook. And when you overlook them, you can't benefit from them. Praise the Lord. And so God says that just as uh, he gave an example, just as Samson saw that new jawbone of a donkey laying around, it was just laying there. He picked it up and he defeated a thousand Philistines with it. And the things that we often overlook are more than enough for us to be able to make happen what God wants to occur in our lives. Somebody say tools, tools. Now, we have an overarching prophetic word uh, for this year, this year, um, you know, that this is the year of validation. It's on the walls uh, and things like that. But as we came to a a conclusion of this year, when God gave me the prophetic word uh, for uh, the prophetic word for uh, new chapters, new chapters. If you can give me the new chapter prophetic word, I want to rehearse this very quickly as I link this to prayer uh, today. It says that this is a continued season and a new chapter. God says, uh, I've rele- I'm releasing an anointing for the new chapter of your life that will empower you to finish what you've started and receive the reward I promised you. Now, along with that, I am linking what my apostle, my pastor, uh, the prophet of my life, Apostle Hilliard, said uh, maybe a month or so ago. He said he had heard from God some things, and they really meshed with, just like they always do, things that he said to me. And this prophetic word that he said, it began to remind us of things that God was doing. Somebody say, in this continued season, right? 
that there would be reciprocal manifestations of obedience in the kingdom of God that will yield amazing, timely results and set in motion future increase. Now, reciprocal manifestations of obedience in the kingdom of God. That simply means that God is going to give faith instructions to do certain things. And if we be willing and obedient, we'll eat the best and have the best that God has for us. And prayer is one of those things. But then also it said, he said that God is going to use divine connections, divine cancellations, divine concepts, and divine consecrations to cause the final quarter of this year to be the catalyst of the greatest yield of your faith all year long. Now, we're believing that, but at the same time, anything that God says in his word, although it is a promise that is firm, a promise that is sure, it's not a promise that's automatic. The will of God is not automatic. Now, I know that you might have heard, just like I did, God can do anything but fail. That's a lie. Because he can't lie. But we, we, take, we say he can do anything but fail, but, but he can't lie. There's lots. Of, he can't go against his word. One of his words, he will not violate the will of man he gives us choice. Someone say God gives us choice. He gives us choice on the most important factor of our lives, and that is the choice to accept his son Jesus as our Lord and Savior. He does, although it's his will that none should perish, all should come to repentance. Y'all know, is everybody in the world going to be saved? And it's not because God's not fair. It's because people won't make the choice to receive the salvation that's been freely given. So with that, I got to make sure you understand that every time we receive a prophetic word, we can shout about it. We can hallelujah to the heavens about it. We can run and dance about it, but it's still not automatic. We have to release our faith for it. Somebody say, if I'm going to receive the promises of God, I've got to release my faith for it. Now, in simplicity, family, with salvation, the Bible says... With the heart, man believes unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made into salvation. And then in Colossians 2 and 6, it says, As you receive the Lord Jesus, walk ye therein. So if we receive Jesus, salvation, receive uh, fellowship with God, an eternal kingdom that he gives to us by believing in our heart and confessing with our mouth, then all of the promises of God are to be received by faith. So if we're believing for new connections, New consecrations, new cancellations, new concepts. If we're believing for the biggest fourth quarter we're going to have ever, I'm believing for double of what God has done from January to October. Excuse me, January to September. I'm believing for double. I'm double in my finances, double in the ministry, double everywhere. How that going to happen? I don't know. He didn't tell me to know. He told me to believe it. But I've got to release my faith for it. So with that, with that being said, I want to get into really, really quickly uh, this optimizing overlooked opportunities for increase message that we're talking from this type of focus. And we're talking about tools for increase. And I began to talk last week that prayer, the prayer of faith, is an overlooked tool for breakthrough. In James 5, and I believe it's 16 in the Amplified, it says, The earnest, heart-filled, continued prayer of a righteous man avails much and makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, so with it, we're believing again that the prayer efforts that we combine and that we make corporately and individually are going to be the catalyst for the power that we need to receive the promise of God. Somebody say, God's empowering me to receive his promises. Now, on last week, and I can't rehearse the whole lesson uh, from last week, and so it's out there online, it's out there, you can get it absolutely free, free 99. But we talked about one of the reasons why prayer is important is because disappointment will rob us of our expectation and our hope. And just beyond disappointment is your deliverance. Just beyond your dissatisfaction is deliverance. Just beyond the delayed promise of God is the promise of God. And what we've got to do is we've got to learn to tap into the power to be able to hold on to receive it. Because that's the only thing that God cannot do for you. He can't hold on for you. But guess what? He can give you the power to hold on. 
Amen. And so in Luke 18 and 1, Jesus spoke a parable unto them. He said to this end, men ought to always pray and not faint. Right. And so that's really what we talked about, why it was so important that we link prayer with this access that we have to God's power in our lives. Somebody say expectation. And that is now I'm going to be talking in the woo, I'm going to be talking during and that's why you want to be here this upcoming Friday. I'm going to be talking about the power of expectation. Not expectation, expect action, expect action. See, because to expect and not act. Don't do nothing. All you doing is waiting, not waiting on the Lord. You just there, but you got hope. <laughs> and, and, but if you want to see your hope received, you got to put some action with it. So that's where expectation comes. Now, I can't get him a lesson, but, but that's what we're going to be talking about this upcoming Friday. Now, as we get into this, let me start from here. You know, the focus, and if you want to write this down, we're going to be talking about intercession, but specifically how to partner for effective intercessory prayer or partnering for effective intercessory prayer, right? And, uh, you know, as we talk and get into this established, uh, uh, the established principles of intercession, go to Ezekiel 22 and 30. And this will give a proof text to what I began to talk about as we opened up uh, our, our dialogue on today. Here it says, in Ezekiel 22 and 30, God says, and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Now, here God is saying that it was not his desire for destruction to come. But why did destruction have to come? Because God said that if my people get out of pocket, I'm paraphrasing, <laughs> if my people, Israel, if they get out of pocket, if they start living without me, if they start worshiping other gods, if they start, you know, having injustice go on in their land, I'm coming to judge some matter. This is Old Testament. I'm coming to judge some matter. Destruction going to come. But he said, listen, if somebody will pray, if somebody will intercede, if somebody will come to me and talk to me and, and say, God, please don't do this. So he said, I'm, I looked for that person, but I didn't find him. And so, you know, so, so it's very important to understand that we see this will of God for certain things to happen because it wasn't his will to destroy. But he had to keep his word. But he also had a word that said in 2 Chronicles 7 and 14, if my people which are called by my name, if they'd humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from the wicked ways, I would hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. So somebody said, God's looking for somebody to intercede. See, God needs our involvement to get things done in the earth. I know that's a new concept for many people because, you know, God can do anything but fail. You know, God does anything he want to do. But really, if you read the Bible, somebody said, if you read the Bible, and a lot of times we came to church and people made statements and we thought they read the Bible because they were there before we came. But the truth of the matter is, they just, a lot of people just quote the stuff that was quoted to them. We can find in Scripture that God created a perfect world. And then in the second verse of Genesis, it got messed up. God created the heaven and the earth. Second verse, the earth was without form and void and darkness covered the face of the deep. Y'all know God didn't create anything void. So something happened. We find out later that the devil got, got messed up in it and, you know, then the third of heaven came down and jacked up the earth. But then God goes to work to put the earth back together and then he creates everything and then on the sixth day he makes man. And he gives him dominion authority. He gives him the ability to run the earth. But y'all know it didn't take Adam very long. Third chapter, he, he messed all that up. Bowed his knee to Satan. How did he bow his knee to Satan? By sinning. He did what say, the Bible says, whom you yield yourself servants to, that's whose servants you are. He took the devil's advice, ate what God said not to eat, and now Satan became the God of this world. So you think that God's hands are tied, right? But God already pronounces what he's going to happen. He says that a seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's heel. That seed of the woman was Jesus. And Jesus came and he defeated Satan, bruised his head, but he bruised his heel. How did he bruise his heel? Y'all know he got crucified and he died, but he rose again with all power. 
And then he said, whoever believes on me ain't going to perish. And he has all power and he's given us power to tread upon serpents and scorpions of all the power of the enemy. Now, I just read all, I said all those things to kind of paraphrase to get you to this point that literally God, just like he did with Jesus, counts on us to invite his participation for his will to come to pass in the earth. Now, you might be saying God can do anything, but can you just really think about the Lord's prayer? Think about the Lord's, you know, what's said as the Lord's prayer. Remember when the disciple says, Lord, teach us to pray like John taught his disciples. And she says, okay, when you pray, say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Oh, it's a test. <laughs> Stop right there. Why did Jesus ask the disciples to pray for the will of God to come, if it could come already? So it's all right there, but at the same time, when we're in trouble, when we're down, when we're depressed, when we are just out of it, we expect God to come and rescue us. But God, even though it's his will for us to be rescued, he cannot come without our participation. Right? Jesus says in Matthew 7, ask, it'll be given. Seek, you'll find. Knock, well, I ain't got to ask. He already know what I need. I ain't got to knock. He already know what I want. I ain't got to seek. He already know what I'm looking for. So it's important that you understand that your prayer efforts invite God's hand to move and change things. Somebody say he'll do it for me. But intercession is about doing it for somebody else. And that's why it's important that we kind of walk through this. Praise the Lord. You know, we can see, you know, that uh, the exhortation of Scripture is that Paul instructs the church to engage in intercession. Go to 1 Timothy 2 and 1. He says, first of all, then I admonish and urge that petitions, prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving be offered on behalf for all men. So he instructs the church to engage in intercession. But then we see Jesus, he occupies a position of an intercessor. Go to Hebrews 7 and 25. Hebrews 7 and 25. I believe it's the Amplified Translation. It says, therefore, he is able also to save to the uttermost completely, perfectly, and finally, and for all time and eternity, those who come to God through him since he is always living to make petition to God and to intercede with him and intervene for them. Somebody say, Jesus is an intercessor. He's praying for you right now. He's praying for God's will to be done in your life. He's praying that you overcome challenges and strongholds in your life. He's praying for somebody. Say, He's just praying for me. Jesus is praying for me. But also, if, you know, the Bible exhorts us that if we will Take on this role of intercessory prayer that there are supernatural benefits. Go to Job 42 and 10. I alluded to this a little earlier, but Job, y'all, would be, you know, and please understand, you ain't going through like Job. You know, all my people who think you're going through, I'm going through like Job. I'm having a Job experience. No, you ain't. <laughs> no, you might be, I, I, I don't doubt that you feel like it, but all you got to do is read that scripture, and ain't nobody had all that happen. You know, but here's the deal. Here's the deal. Job's going through, and it's terrible when you go through, and the ones who you call friends basically tell you you the reason that you're going through. Now, the Bible already says Job was a righteous man, but his friends said, you got to be doing something. Don't make God a liar. So he's going through, but finally when he gets on his feet, God hems his friends up and tells them, all y'all, all y'all was wrong. And Job going to have to pray for y'all to get restored. And then God tells Job to pray for his friends. And when he does, this is where we pick it up. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job and restored his fortunes when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had had before. So literally interceding for your enemies is the key to increase. I know you want to hate them. I know you want them to fall off a cliff and die and all their children die and all their legacy die because you've just been hurt that bad. 
And you wouldn't be alone because David wanted the same thing. The man after God's own heart. It didn't mean that. He was in pursuit of God. But David has some issues. But so do we. But God used him. And I'm telling you that the key to you seeing this fourth quarter increase is going to be the cat. One of them is going to be the catalyst of your prayer, specifically for those who hid from you. What do you mean? You needed help. They wouldn't answer the phone. You needed help. They didn't come to the door. You, I, you can tell when folk avoid you. You can find them all the time until you need them. But you got to pray for them. You got to pray for them. Then you got to pray for those who hurt you. Yeah, I, I know this, this wasn't a message maybe you thought you needed, but everybody wants fourth quarter increase, right? <laughs> those who hurt you, you know, lied on you. Talk about you. Sure is you're born. Took advantage of you. Took advantage of your innocence. You didn't know they were gaming you, but all the time you were being gamed. You got to pray for them. Then there are those who didn't hurt you. They didn't harm you, but they hindered you. They could have put in a good word for you. You know, when they begin to ask around the office, who should we promote? I don't know about her. You know, she'd be late. You know, she's not necessarily thought of as the best associate. You know what I mean? You got to pray for them. You got to pray for them. See, I know we all want to pray for those who help us. Somebody say that's low-level prayer. But if you want to pray like Jesus, Father, forgive those. <laughs> Everybody want to be like Jesus till they come to prayer. And I'm telling you, this is a key. Now, there are other examples. And according to Romans 15 and 4, it says, Whatever things that were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. We see other instances of intercession that we also want to adopt. Like our church, our name of our church is based off of the centurion who came to Jesus in Matthew, I believe it's Matthew 8. He comes to Jesus and he's beseeching him, saying, My servant is sick at home. Will you Will you heal him? And she said, I'll come. He says, no, no, no. No, no, no. Just speak a word only. My servant will be healed. So what you see there is a picture of intercession. Someone coming to Jesus on behalf of someone else. And he comes to Jesus on behalf of his servant. His servant. His servant. Not his boss. His servant. Not someone who can do something else for him. His servant. And Jesus answered the prayer. But then we see the intercession of the church when Peter was in trouble. And that's really one of the things because you have to understand. Someone say, look around. I know things could be well with you, but chances are that the third person that you count as you move from left to right is going through something right now. And sometimes we can, ign we can ignore the fact that somebody else is going through. I don't need to intercede because all is well with me. But we see when Peter got hemmed up in Acts, in Acts 12 and 5, it begins to read, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And y'all know as they prayed, an angel ends up, Peter was, so, Peter was at rest. Number one, Peter wasn't freaking out. He was asleep. He, he was so asleep, he was naked, laying between two soldiers. They're praying, the angel comes. And hits him on and had to hit him to wake him up. He said, Peter, put your clothes on. We're we leaving. And Peter didn't know it was a dream or not. He's, fought, he's, he's, he's walking through door and gate after gate. And then finally, he comes and knocks on the door. And they're praying so fervently that they didn't even believe it was Peter. Personal note. God said that when we begin to intercede with passion like that, he will answer our prayers so fast, we won't even believe that it was him that did it yet. Well, somebody knocking, they say it's Peter, but he in jail. 
Somebody say expectation. And so that's what we want to do because the Bible says in 1 John 4 and 17, herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment for as he is, how Jesus is, that's how we, in, that's how we are in this world. Somebody say, I'm going to be like Jesus. I'm going to be an intercessor. It's therefore established that we should be praying for one another. That's why it is an emergency. It's an emergency. It's an emergency. When you see the word emergency on ambulances, it's in red in big letters. When, when you see the emergency at the hospital, there's something obviously that's going on where life is in danger. And right now we are in a position where lives, spiritual and natural, are in danger. And if we're going to be like Jesus, we have a role to play because God wants to rescue. God wants to revive. God wants to renew. God wants to restrict what the enemy is doing, but he has to be invited. And he doesn't need everybody. But look around, somebody say, he needs somebody. Because the Bible says, when I read that in Ezekiel, he looked around the earth and found no one. So all it takes is somebody, and that's why it's an emergency. Somebody say, somebody got to pray. So the expediency of intercessor in the word is something that must be responded to. Go to Matthew 15, Matthew 15, and it talks about this woman of Samaria. And the Bible says, then Jesus went this and departed in the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came, uh, Canaan, I said Samaria, came out of the same I think it's a Syrophoenician woman. That's what this is. Coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter, she says, is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and saw him, saying, Send her away, for she cries after us. Man, this woman bothering us, Jesus. But he answered and said to the woman, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it's not me to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. And she said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answers this unto her, woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto you, even as you will. And her daughter, daughter was made whole from that hour. You see this woman's state of emergency? She went to Jesus instead of being worried and distraught, instead of being out of pocket. She went to the one who could help her. She had heard he was healing everywhere he went. She had heard that he's doing miracle signs and wonders. And she goes. But when she goes, she's met with a condition. The condition was, Jesus says, I wasn't sent to y'all yet. I was sent to my people. And she basically humbled herself and said, okay, I understand that. I, I know my position. But still, I recognize that even a scrap from Jesus is more than enough. And he said to her, great is your faith. Your daughter is healed. See, expediency, expediency is an action taken as a priority of options to resolve an immediate situation. And you got to understand as a believer at all times, there's more to your situation than what you see. See, most of the time you're under attack, but you don't even know it. You're under attack, but you think it's just, you know, everybody go through that. No, you're under attack. You're under attack. And, and I, have to, I have to pull the cover off and help you to understand when you're under attack, you got to do something about it. It ain't going to pass just because you're silent. Unfortunately, the devil does not leave because of your silence. If I stop, he'll, he'll leave me alone. No, he didn't do that. See, you have to recognize the expediency of your prayer. You have to understand that there's a spiritual arena of life that cannot be denied. You know, everything that happens to you naturally has a spiritual root. And if you want to stop the fruit from manifesting, you got to go to the root and you go through the root with your prayers. Right. We're trying to chop things off in the natural and they keep growing back. Right. A lot of our family dysfunction is really generational, but nobody went to the root. 
Well, somebody else should have went to the root. No, the one who's bothered by it now has a response. My granddaddy should have went to the root. He didn't do it. My grandmammy should have. Ah, she didn't do it. My mama didn't. So she didn't do it. So you going to let your children go through it? You, you going to let everybody else because somebody else didn't do it? Well, it's not fair. Oh, yes, it is. Because he who prays for it is he who receives double for it. Okay, you, you're not getting it. I just told you what Job did. And, and so, yeah, it's a spiritual arena that, that can't be denied. Understand there's a spiritual attack. It can be devastating. I don't doubt the negative things that are happening are terrible. But also there's a spiritual action that causes God's deliverance. And prayer is, again, that key. And there's a spiritual ally that is dependable. Now, the sovereign reliance on prayer dictates that we be expedient. You know, God says, if my people which are called by my name will hum themselves, then he begins to show up. But here's why, again, it's important that we show. Somebody say, I know God will show up when I pray, but it's important that I first show up to pray. Now, 1 Peter 5 and 8, and I'm going to get into this, and I'm taking a little bit more time, um, but at the same time, I have to uh, because it's an emergency. It's an emergency. This is why I'm doing the 21-day prayer that's coming up. Well, you know, it takes longer than 21 days. Nope, not to make a habit. Not to make a habit. And we want the habit of prayer. We want the habit of prayer. So in 1 Peter 5 and 8, what does it say? It says to be sober, to be vigilant, watchful. So stay in your right mind and be vigilant. Keep your eyes open for your adversary. Who's the adversary? Not the person at the job. Not the spouse you don't like right now. Not whatever enemy you want to put a face on. Your adversary is who? The The devil. And the Bible says, as a roaring lion, he walketh about, seeking whom he may what? So he's looking for the person who is vulnerable and weak. And see, you might be strong in the Lord in the power of his might, but if you don't guard your heart and keep it safe with prayer, you're vulnerable to becoming weak. And weakness is usually the place of attack where you do things that you would not normally do. See, Satan attacks through the door of innocence. You know, number one, you know, a lot of times we get hurt because we had our guard down because the person who cared for us shouldn't have been the person who prayed on us. I'm talking about child abuse, spousal abuse. Man, you know, all that stuff. And, you know, again, and again, this is what I'm saying. Some stuff is generational. But because of because of shame and all kind of things, like anybody else, nobody else had this happen. But you think you're going to be diminished. Because you pray and seek help and deliverance from it. But the whole thing is, again, innocence is how that door gets open. And then once it gets open again, now it has now smeared this person to go. And those who are abused, if they are not delivered, become abusers. Then there is Satan coming through the door of intention. You know, intention is you think you're strong enough. You can drop it when you feel like it. I'm talking about them habits. <laughs> you, you know, you know it, this drug, this, this don't control me. I can quit when I want to. I'm talking about all my weed heads right now. Yeah, I know it's legal in Denver, Washington. It ain't legal here yet for recreational, but, I, I, man, I'm getting out the car so much, especially with these young people now, man. And I'm telling you, I'm catching a contact at the car wash. Y'all know what a contact is? That's, that's when you start getting high from somebody else's fumes. But at the same time, it's a habit. And all I do, all you have to do is, well, it, it's, it's not harmful. It calms my nerves. I thought Jesus was a prince of peace. You ain't, you ain't got glaucoma. Uh, 
I'm, I'm meddling now. You know, and then see, you got to, Jesus, I'm taking my time. But see, dabbling is what does you in. <laughs> I know I was in so country. Dabbling is what does you in. And see, the enemy, he tricks you into thinking that just because you dabble, just because you get a little taste every once in a while, that ain't a problem. But truth is, that opens the door to temptation. And once you walk into the door of temptation, it'll take you in there. You'll stay longer than you wanted to stay. You'll do more than you thought you wanted to do. But see, this, this part where you think you can stop when you want to, that's just a lie. He does it with pornography. All of this on a prayer message? Yes. Because these are the ones that, this is what we need to be praying about. Well, I don't do it all the time. But you don't want it visiting every three months. See, if, if it visits every three months, it's a habit. I don't do it all the time. And see, here's the thing. If you might have had the door opened in innocence, I could even say like I did. You know, I, I was exposed to pornography probably at the age of uh, 11 or 12 by my uncle. 11, 12, you know. And again, that thing is devastating. Here's why. It messes up the reward centers of your brain that cause you to crave it to fulfill and make sure that you get, you, you get your, your, your little opiate rush. And you don't realize it's, it's that, that that's what's called. And here's the thing. If you're not careful, it'll stay with you. But part of it is call it out. You just saw what I just talked about. I ain't got no shame. I ain't, I ain't, do, I ain't watching porn. But I used to. But y'all remember the things that you used to do. That's what we say. We don't. But some of y'all still doing them. And we want the power and promises of God. And we think that grace gets us by. Grace does get us by. But, oh, God, go to Jeremiah 5 and 25. I had to deal with this right quick. Because the grace message, you, you, so many people pervert it. The grace message does not mean that God doesn't want us to be holy. The grace message simply means that God understands that it took something that he had to do to get us delivered from it. And that shed blood gives us space within the grace to get ourselves together, not to save us, but to please him. See, you thought doing right got you to heaven, but doing right pleases the father. Yes. Jeremiah 5 and 25 says, your iniquities, hidden sin, has turned away these things and your sins have withhold in what? How many people, you want four quarter blessings? This is, this is the road. Well, other people got blessed and they, they, they trifling. Who told you that was a blessing? Who, who, who? Did God tell you that was a blessing? Some people get blessed out of talent and manipulation. Some people steal good. I didn't say feel good. Steal good. Satan attacks through the door of ignorance. You're just totally unaware, and so you dial in the psychic hotline. Y'all ain't calling Cleo. I don't know if she's live or not now, but. You still Capricorning and Sagittarius and what star were you born under? And then you try to get biblical. Jesus was born under a star. Got these trinkets and burning incense. Now, I burn incense, but I want it to smell good. No, really. I want my house to smell good. I don't even do that. I do the plug-ins now. Ain't nobody worshiping them. I do the plug-ins. But see, these are the things. Again, it's also, oh, gosh, this is me. This is me. This is me. Oh, gosh, this is me. Ooh, when I put this down, I was like, Satan attacks through the door of infuriation. That's when you get so upset, so angry at people, sometimes who try to provoke you. They know they're doing it. Do you know that one of the reasons why God does not want us to be angry and sin, he said be angry and sin not, 
So you can have righteous indignation, but you have, that's control. You have control with it. Because when you become angry, you become spiritually weak. Have you ever noticed as soon as you're done being angry with somebody, you're just so tired? You just don't want to do nothing. Ah! Ah! Some people get so angry they pass out. <laughs> he attacks you also. And, you know, that's another thing. That's why I got to pray. You know, people who have children raised in church, for some reason, the enemy really attacks, attacks church kids. Yeah. Especially if you were raised and you had spiritual leadership and you raised your children's church. Just be just angry, just silently angry, just simmering. And the, the reason also... When you're so angry, you do things that you wouldn't normally do, right? And now you find yourself serving time. Now, I ain't talking about this time. I'm talking about time, this time, right? And then finally, Satan attacks through the door of intimidation. What is that? That's when you don't receive correction with joy. You get so angry that you just want to rebel and walk out. But the thing is, the Bible says I'm not ignorant of his devices. That's why I had to tell you all these devices. It wasn't really to try to light a fire under you or expose you. But I have to make you aware of what the devil is doing, but also the way that we overcome it. Somebody say, it's through prayer. It's through prayer. <sighs> Endurance. Endurance is the stamina and strength of character to hold a predetermined course without wavering. It's the resolve to achieve through perseverance. I said we're going to be praying over the next 21 days. But the part that I want to tell you about, though, that, that, you know, that I can testify. Somebody say testify. But, but hurry up, Pastor. All right. See, I stand before you a person who was incredibly immature, um, who was trifling, who was undependable. And I'm mentioning all of my faults. All of them I had a reason for. Somebody say so. <laughs> the condition that I was in, unfortunately, God tells my wife, my future wife, Angela, at the age of 16, 17, that I was to be her that I was going to be her husband. He never told me that. He told her that. And she had to pray for me. Because the package that God said was her present, presently did not look like something she wanted. So she had to intercede for me. And she interceded for me, and I came to myself, and I got saved. And you think that you could just sign it, and the rest is history. Nope. The fool that I was is the fool I still became. Because I, I wasn't consistent in my walk with God. And... She prayed for me. You know, I found out later that there were times that I'd be sleeping. She'd put oil on my head. And I'd be waking up. And I, somebody, somebody said, how come you didn't know? Because I had a jerry curl. <laughs> I had a jerry curl back then. I was ready for the world. <laughs> they don't know nothing about that. They don't know nothing about that. They don't know nothing about that, y'all. I was ready for the world. And so when I took the bag off, I just thought it was the extra. So she was, she was putting oil on my head and praying and interceding for me and praying and interceding for me. And God told her one day that I would be a pastor or a minister. And he had, God never told me none of that. She's praying for me, and God told her one day that I would be rich, and I would, I would be a benefit and a blessing to her, our family, and everyone else, and he didn't tell me none of that, but she prayed for me, and I'm saying this to say you, say this to you. See, when God begins to talk to you about the people that he wants you to intercede for, most of the time, they're not in the package presently that you want to receive, but if you'll believe God and become their intercessor, 
I'm telling you, God is faithful and he will deliver. He will transform. He will change. And he does it a lot of times, just like the church who prayed for Peter. They were praying for him and praying for him. And then one day, day. Peter's knocking at the door. I'm here. It can't be Peter. They they about to kill him. And that's what happened to me. One day, God arrested my heart. And it wasn't because of this person. I, there might have been other people, that were, but I know she was praying for me. There might have been other people. And I, don't, I, I, tell you, I receive all the prayers, but I know specifically she interceded with me or for me. But the reason she did it was she believed the promise. See, sometimes the people that God has called you to pray for, the enemy, <laughs> the enemy will try to convince you to pray on them because you can't, you tired. <laughs> you tired of their mess. Yeah. You tired of this ain't changing. You tired of all of this different stuff. And God says, if you'll hold out and pray. And because she prayed, y'all think I'm just telling this for nothing. Stands before you a pastor in the Lord's church that thousands have been saved and delivered and transformed. You would not be here unless her intercession happened. Now, see, I don't have every pastor's testimony. When I give her honor, that's really one of the reasons I'm giving honor because The reason that I am the pastor that I am is because she took the role of an intercessor seriously. Who does God want to change through your prayers? That will change generations. That will be there in your future. What does God want to do? I'm telling you, he wants to do exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think. Everybody's standing all over the building. I know that this message doesn't have you running the aisles. But if you can picture in your future, when you receive everything that, you got, that God promised you, you're going to be wanting to run around. And God told me this with every head bowed and every eye closed. Thank you, Holy Spirit. He told me this. He says, Patrick, he says, never allow what you cannot do today hinder you from what you can do today. What you can do today when you do it will change what you can do tomorrow. And he tells me this promise and give you even more options. Okay. Why did you say all of that? Most of the reasons, family, we are down because of what we cannot currently do. What you want to change that you can't change right now. Where you want to go that you can't go right now. What you want to possess that you can't possess right now. And God told me, he says, that's the hindrance that locks people up keeps them from releasing their faith for me to do all that I want to do in their present that they'll realize tomorrow. And I said, wow, God, you're absolutely right about that. I lose my enthusiasm when I focus on what I can't do. But I become empowered when I concentrate on what I can. We're going to concentrate and focus for these next 21 days on what we can do. We're going to pray the word from 6 a.m. to 6, 17 a.m. Each morning, I'll be leading you. And I'm telling you that we're believing for God to arrest some things, for his power to be released, to change some things. And he says, I'll do it if you'll invite me. (laughs) I'll do it if you'll invite me with the expectation of prayer. See, we're going to pray And then we're going to get up from prayer and we're going to act on what we prayed for. All day we're going to see our enemies delivered and healed. All day we're going to see the person in our family, the child that we're praying for, coming to Jesus and coming to themselves. All day we're going to see the things that we need to be changed in our finances or our health. We're going to see them and we're going to watch God work 
and it's going to be done. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we receive this message of faith and we commit to becoming your prayer intercessors, realizing, God, that it's our role. But, God, I thank you that you give a benefit for those who will pray in Jesus' name. Give the Lord a great big hand praise. Amen.